This year, Mountain Voices is highlighting the research of Plymouth State faculty who are doing research in the White Mountains and the Lakes regions. If you're interested in seeing past presence at the uh, past presentations, at the end of Tommy's presentation, we will, uh, I'll put in the chat box, the link so that you can go in and see some of the other ones. During the presentation, if you have a question or a comment you'd like to make, would you please put it in the chat box at the bottom of your screen? We'll also have time at the end for Q&A at the end of Dr. Stoughton's talk. Tonight, we are lucky to be able to learn from Dr. Tommy Stoughton. Thomas Stoughton was born, uh, joined the Biological Sciences Department at PSU in 2016. He's an evolutionary biologist with a PhD in botany, focusing on assessing biodiversity and sessile organisms, which he can tell you what those are, principally plants and fungi, using a broad spectrum of biogeographic cytological, ecological, genetic, including genomic, and morphological data, morpho, I missed that one, sorry, morphological data. The main objective of Stoughton's research efforts is to provide useful information to land managers and practitioners of biology so they can, in turn, make informed decisions regarding conservation of biological diversity. Tommy, it's all yours. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, let me just share my screen here. How's that? All right. Uh, I presume you can all see the presentation at this point. Heads are nodding, yes. Okay, um, so uh, welcome everyone to my seminar this evening, highlighting the diversity and distribution of fungi in our local mountains. Uh, my interest in botany and mycology is mostly centered around food, uh, so much of the discussion tonight uh, will focus on edible species uh, and uh, more importantly palatable species, which is something I'll talk about um, and perhaps make the distinction between later, but uh, there are a lot of uh, fungi that you can eat that you don't necessarily uh, have any business eating, I'll say. Um, and uh, Marsha already mentioned that if you have any questions, they can't really be conveniently, conveniently handled um, during the talk. So I encourage you to type your questions into the chat as they come up um, so that they can be addressed at the end. So um, before I get into th the thick of things, I need to give you a little bit of a roadmap of where we're going with the seminar. Um, first, I'll introduce you to some general information regarding fungi before I highlight just a few groups of macrofungi that I find terribly interesting for a variety of reasons uh, and which are locally abundant and easily foraged. Uh, after that, I'll briefly discuss some data concerning the effects of mushroom foraging on fu future production uh, in these same areas. Uh, and then that should seg naturally into uh, some ethical considerations uh, when it comes to mushroom foraging and really foraging in general. Uh, lastly, I'll mention how you can get involved uh, in advancing our understanding of diversity and distribution of these organisms uh, locally and globally uh, with a couple of nifty resources that are available for free. So uh, to begin with the introduction to fungi, uh, it's important to know that fungi occur in every environment on Earth, uh, and they are the workhorses of nearly every well-studied ecosystem on the planet. Uh, they're major decomposers playing a critical role in nutrient cycling uh, by breaking down complex organic compounds into simpler ones and supplying these to other organisms through a variety of means. Uh, many fungi form natural symbioses, including parasitisms, mutualisms, and commensalisms, uh, and incredibly relevant to our daily lives, uh, fungi are terribly important when it comes to food and drug production. Uh, so below the text in the bottom right, see uh, here, uh, I'm just showing a simplified diagram demonstrating the partnership between a plant and a fungus called a mycorrhizal association, uh, which I'll refer to mycorrhizal species a number of times tonight. Uh, and that is an association wherein nutrients are exchanged between the two mutualists. So it's sort of this handshake where each uh, member benefits from the partnership. 
um, as opposed to a parasitism uh, where one benefits and the other is harmed. Uh, so in the lower left, I'm just showing a example of a piece of pro uh, fungus propaganda, uh, basically highlighting a fungus that many of us hardly think about, penicillin, uh, that's been a major player in modern medicine since its accidental discovery in the 1920s. Like, and then the next slide. There we go. Yeah, okay. So uh, some fungi that are garnering attention lately, um, primarily due to elevated environmental conservation concerns, uh, include white nose syndrome featured in the top left, uh, which is killing uh, a lot of bees by, or bees, bats, uh, by basically preventing hibernation um, and basically weakening the bats until they succumb. Uh, and in the top right, a chytrid fungus, uh, both of which are basically having de devastating effects on the organisms that they uh, are attacking. Um, and lastly, I'm guessing that everyone in this room, this virtual room, is familiar with uh, many of the different kinds of molds associated with food spoilage, uh, which have obvious effects on food production and distribution. Uh, and one thing I might mention with regard to this is that mycelia of fungi are microscopic. Uh, so if you think you're cutting off that spoiled part and saving the rest of whatever it is that you intend to eat, uh, I can assure you that you are going to eat mold and it's best to just toss your spoiled food rather than trying to be like super Spartan about it. Um, there's just no getting around mycelia because they are everywhere. Uh, so one major take home I'd like you to remember from the seminar is that the kingdom fungi is incredibly diverse. Uh, both as a source of food and medicine, and that is not even the half of it. Uh, there are numer numerous colors, shapes, smells, and textures that you can see by taking a stroll through the forest a few days after it rains during the summer and fall months. And that said, I'll be highlighting just some of the locally abundant and more delicious varieties uh, known as macrofungi, but macrofungi represent only the tip of the iceberg when it comes to fungal diversity. And there's a great uh, uh, body of work, but there's a large diversity of fungi that exist in the lichens, which I'm basically going to totally ignore uh, tonight. So if you're interested in learning more about that, I encourage you uh, to uh, dive into lichen biology because it's very, very interesting. Um, so we can't have a mushroom talk without covering some mushroom terminology. Uh, so hopefully this is pretty straightforward for most of you. Uh, the top. Uh, of the cap, um, or the top of the mushroom is a cap with the gills underneath that hold the structures that release spores in reproduction, which are sort of the equivalent of seeds and plants, which I'm sure more of, uh, you're more familiar with. Uh, the stem or the stipe is the stalk of the mushroom. Uh, sometimes a vulva sac or a skirt or a ring may occur, which are evidence of other membranes or tissues that used to envelop the mushroom, either partially or entirely in early development. Uh, and the mycelia are the body of the fungus, uh, which exists usually in the ground and may occur in other hats, including aquatic environs. Uh, and so that's an important point that I'll come back to later, that the mycelia is the body and the mushroom is really the equivalent of a fruit. So when you pick a mushroom, it's like you're picking a tomato or an apple off of a tree. Um, so that said, I wanna talk about a few fungi tonight, including the boletes, which are among the more diverse macrofungi and they happen to be my specialty. Uh, now I use the term bolete to refer to anything in the order boletales, uh, which is a pretty broad concept to some, uh, but certainly there are things that you consider boletes that if you are already familiar with them, uh, such as slippery jacks uh, in the genus Swillus, which are technically in a different family, Swillaceae, within the order Boletales. So some people draw the line at family, whereas I have a more broader concept at the order. And the fun of this concept, though, is that there are poroid boletes, which I'll talk about and show and most people are familiar with with the distinctive underside of the cap that's packed with tubes, kind of look like the surface of a sponge. Uh, but there are many other forms of boletes, including gilled boletes, puff boletes, and there are even golden, golden boletinoid truffles in Australia. So it's a really cool concept. 
that really kind of breaks people's brains when you think about how these are all uh, closely related to one another nonetheless. Uh, and so just to um, show you the uh, underside of a bolete to give you a sense of that sort of diagnostic feature that is characteristic of many boletes. And I love boletes for a variety of reason, reasons, including the fact that many are choice edibles and there are no boletes that will cause death, only severe gastrointestinal distress. So if you make an incorrect identification with a bolete that you plan to eat, it's unlikely to be your last meal, uh, though you may wish you were dead for a brief period after ingesting the mushroom. Um, and so the other reason that I love boletes is that they're easily recognizable and hyperabundant, uh, more or less through the entire summer and fall seasons. So very rarely do I go out in the summer and not come back with at least a couple different boletes in my basket. Uh, and so it's really uh, a group that includes many species so they can be difficult to identify and so some beginners kind of are steered away from this group of organisms but um, really they are safe generally speaking as far as uh, the potential repercussions of making a misidentification. Uh, just to introduce you to a few that you're likely to encounter in our mountains uh, one of the more difficult groups of boletes in our area, which includes some edible species and some with a relatively high percentage of seemingly idiosyncratic sickenings, are the birch boletes, genus Lexum. Um, aside from the orange-capped Lexinum, though, uh, it's a fairly safe genus, which is otherwise very easy to recognize by the presence of brown or black scabers. So the picture on the top shows clearly the dark scabers of Lexinum versepoli which give it the appearance of having like a dirty stipe or stem. And these are actually fibers of the stipe that break off at their tips and stain uh, a dark color, usually as I mentioned, black or brown. Um, and below I'm, I'm showing three different lexinum that are principally differentiated by their cap color. Uh, though the size, distribution and color of these scabers, which I mentioned previously, along with internal staining reactions, whether they turn blue or gray or purple or go through a series of these colors are extremely important for identification of these mushrooms. So most importantly, when identifying Lexinum, it's imperative to note the host tree, as many of these are mycorrhizal species, which I mentioned earlier, uh, that have a very picky palate. So if you know this species grows under a hemlock, then it's unlikely to be any other Lexinum than such and such species. So that can be really handy if you're uh, very good at tree identification and you happen to be in a stand that is strictly one species, say a hemlock grove. Uh, another bolete that many are familiar with and perhaps one of the most highly prized mushrooms on earth, uh, along with truffles and morels is porcini or the king bolete, which broadly re refers to members of the Boletus edulis group. Um, Boletus chippewa insis, pictured here, is our conifer-loving porcini, and it's the most abundantly found um, primarily under hemlock, at least in my immediate area, uh, but it can be found under a diversity of conifers, especially in the fall, uh, and when they, are, when they are in season, which is generally most prolific just a little bit before leaf peeping season, um, it's darn near impossible to go out into your local woods and not find one or 10 of these. Uh, you can practically kick them over if you're not paying attention. And this large mushroom with a greasy cap and a meaty swollen stem is most readily identified by its fine white reticulum, uh, which is this ornamentation on the stem shown here, uh, the mushroom is upside down. So that yellow part that you're looking at are actually the pores underneath the cap. So at the top of the stem, you have this cobweb pattern, uh, most notably at the apex of the stipe, but sometimes it can extend below, um, and especially where uh, it attaches to the cap. The pore surface is initially white, which is what we call stuffed pores, but as the mushroom matures, the pores can become more visible and become greenish yellow and mature to olive or olive green. Uh, the flesh does not change color when the mushroom is sliced, which is an important feature, uh, distinguishing it from a close lookalike. Uh, and its surfaces do not bruise upon handling, 
uh, though the cap of Boletus chippewaensis specifically can be scratched with the back of your fingernail and will stain pinkish uh, almost instantly if the mushroom is hydrated. Uh, these mushrooms are darn right delicious, though they still aren't technically top of my list. Uh, I do, however, chase these around pretty much all summer and fall, uh, and they come out in droves usually at least once per year. Uh, easily preserved with dehydration and their flavor improved is great uh, for winter eats uh, in a cold place like New Hampshire. Uh, and I've even started making ice cream using dried porcini powder to flavor it, which is, uh, was a surprise, uh, but pretty fun. It's, it's a very sweet mushroom, good for gravies and such. Uh, still more edible boletes worth a quick mention. Uh, the genus Swillis is a diverse genus that I mentioned earlier associated with conifers and containing a large number of edible species in our area. Uh, a handful only of which are actually also palatable, uh, including the eastern painted swillus, uh, swillus spragii pictured on the bottom there. Um, this species doesn't quite have the characteristic uh, glandular dots and slimy caps that make many swillus uh, recognizable. Uh, but this is perhaps what makes it one of the better tasting species in the genus, uh, good for flatbreads and things like that. Uh, so generally, while swillus are edible, uh, they'll often turn a stir fry into a slippery mess, and they're probably best dehydrated and ground into a spice, which can be used as a thickening agent for cream sauces and soups. Uh, many of them have great flavor, but the sliminess is difficult to mitigate, and it may actually cause some gastrointestinal upset uh, if eaten in large quantities. So it's an abundant mushroom, but maybe not a mushroom that you want to eat uh, large abundances of. So I could talk about boletes all day. Uh, so perhaps we can arrange to do this again in the future where I can do an expose of the order. Uh, but due to time constraints, I'll have to leave it there. Um, suffice to say, this is an incredibly diverse and interesting order comprising many distinctive edible species with a, a wide variety of colors uh, and fascinating ornamentations. So I'll be able to understand both and continuing to hone my skills for many years to come. Uh, but I don't think that I'll ever stop paying attention to them, uh, nor will I stop making up common names for the lesser known boletes, such as uh, poor man's porcini pictured here, which is uh, one of my winter staples, uh, a birch associate. So very common in New Hampshire. Uh, moving on from the boletes to another group that I recommend for beginners. Uh, we're gonna talk about the artist formerly known as the Cantharyl Laceae. Uh, this is the Hydnaceae, which is a fungal family which includes many choice edibles, such as golden chanterelles and hedgehog mushrooms. Uh, and the family is included in the order Cantharyl Lales, along with other clavarioid fungi in the Clavulinaceae. Uh, I mentioned golden chanterelles because it's a very common mushroom which can be found throughout New Hampshire in a variety of habitats. Uh, that's one thing that our acidic soils are good for uh, because it's certainly not favorable for morels. Uh, now, chanterelles in genus Cantharellus have a handful of collectively diagnostic features and it's reasonably distinct when it comes to other mushrooms considered by some to be lookalikes. So the flavor and aroma are very distinct as well. And these mushrooms grow, go wonderful with cream of mushroom soup or any kind of cream sauce, really. Again, food, food, always food. That's all I think about. Um, so with exception for black trumpets, uh, which are popular and uh, palatable, uh, genus Craterellus is perhaps a lesser known cousin of the golden chanterelles. Uh, and that said, there are a handful of edible species in this genus. Uh, some of which can be extremely abundant during the season and are also worth getting to know uh, if you're interested in sort of forest to table activities. Uh, they have similar gills or proto gills to that which are found on golden chanterelles, uh, but the key distinction is that they're hollow through their stem, so sort of funnel from vape like a trump. And uh, these are probably my favorite chanterelles to eat, so definitely one to look for. Uh, if you can start to recognize the species and or the habitats in which they occur. So uh, the last of the chanterelles that I'm going to talk about tonight is genus Hydnum, or uh, what I'm calling the toothy chanterelles, also known uh, to many foragers as hedgehog mushrooms. Uh, 
these are a group of fungi which are fairly simple to identify, uh, at least a genus, and truly choice in terms of flavor and texture. Uh, hogs are abundant fall given appropriate conditions, and they're highly resistant to rot like other chanterelles, uh, which give them a fairly long shelf life uh, if refrigerated. Um, in the case of the depressed hedgehog, they often grow in the same habitat as, uh, and at the same time as some species of craterellus. So again, if you learn to identify that habitat, which is basically sphagnum bogs, I'd say it's worth checking that area around late August, early September when it starts to get cold at night. So again, if I haven't kind of hammered it home yet, uh, the kingdom fungi is incredibly diverse. Uh, and at times they're extremely bountiful. Um, but what happens exactly, I haven't talked about, when you pick a mushroom? Um, and so to answer that, uh, we have to address just a few basics. Um, I mentioned before, uh, you'll recall that the mushroom is sort of the fruit uh, and the mycelium is the body of the fungus, which exists in the ground and sometimes in other habitats. And it's this body that's, uh, of the fungus that's an important piece to under, understand because it's the ephemeral nature of mushrooms that makes them a renewable resource that can be sustainably produced and or harvested in the same way and or similar ways as many plant crops. Uh, so before we look at just a, a little bit of data, uh, the key finding of the study that I'm gonna discuss at least in brief is summarized in the abstract which I've highlighted here, um, and I'm not sure if you can all read it, but uh, namely the results reveal that contrary to expectations, long-term and syst systematic harvesting reduces neither the future yields of fruit bodies nor the species richness of wild forest fungi, irrespective of whether the harvest technique was picking or cutting. So to, to say that again and more simply, whether or not you pick a mushroom, it has no effect on how many mushrooms will be produced in the future in that location. Uh, so looking at the data, this is a key figure from the study, which I will just kind of break down for you. On the left uh, is a panel that includes species diversity. And on the right is uh, sort of the number of mushrooms or a log number of mushrooms. Uh, and in the A panel, so the top, it's showing um, basically uh, plots where mushrooms were picked versus where they were not picked. And as you look across from left to right, basically it's through the years, it's a long-term study. Uh, there was no statistical difference between these two treatments. So whether or not you picked a mushroom or didn't pick a mushroom didn't affect uh, how many mushrooms there were in the future. It really was um, directly correlated with precipitation that's what was correlated with these up and downs uh, that I'm showing. But on the bottom, uh, in uh, a little bit kind of in contrast, the treatments where they constructed uh, basically some catwalks or boardwalks. So they were able to uh, determine the number of mushrooms that were produced in an area without trampling the area while sampling in the survey they found that the trampling actually did have an effect on the number of mushrooms that were produced in that season. So um, while long-term effects uh, were not necessarily uh, present, basically if they moved the catwalks around, then the mushrooms produced in that area would be more like the other controls. Uh, but what they found was that there might be some effects of trampling an area when you are foraging. And that's relevant when we kind of talk about the, the ethics of foraging. So some caveats, uh, as they're always, uh, this is not exactly giving us a green light to go ahead and forage to our heart's content because it doesn't matter if you pick a mushroom. Uh, there are a number of caveats, including the fact that this was not uh, actually a study conducted on this continent as uh, conducted in Switzerland. So perhaps some similar habitats and habitat types, even some shared species in the study. Uh, it's not exactly a, a green light to go ahead and pick every mushroom we see. Uh, there were also only soft bodied or sort of annual mushrooms that were sampled in the study. So 
uh, perennial mushrooms, these hard bodied mushrooms that take many, many years to mature or add um, new reproductive layers and their fecundity or their ability to reproduce sort of goes up uh, exponentially over time, uh, probably respond differently to being picked. Inedible versus edible species, there may be some difference. Uh, just sort of thinking about evolutionarily responses to uh, whether or not a mushroom is picked, uh, there might be something there. And then also sclerotia uh, are not mentioned at all in this study. And these are sort of uh, the storage organs. Many people are familiar with chaga, uh, which is not actually a mushroom. It's one of these storage organs or sclerotia. Um, but there are other mushrooms that uh, either um, form from sclerotia or uh, actually the the sort of mushroom that people forage for is actually the sclerotium itself and not a mushroom. So probably respond differently, all of them, to uh, harvesting of some kind. Uh, so that uh, we can say to the last component of the seminar, which is sort of the ethics of sustainable foraging uh, or minimally invasive ethics anyways, uh, as this cartoon likes to sort of demonstrate we're always going to be sort of doing something whether or not we uh, know uh, sort of how much harm we're doing is kind of what we're trying to minimize. Uh, and if there's one home, one sort of take home that I can give you with respect to these um, ethics is uh, it's that you get yourself educated uh, because you'll simultaneously empower yourself uh, when you learn more about your surrounding environs and also the principles of good land stewardship. So uh, knowing your eco ecology is of utmost importance, knowing what's abundant in your area versus what's at risk uh, may be relevant again, uh, uh, thinking about these sort of uh, uh, perennial mushrooms or sclerotia such as chaga, uh, how abundant are they really and what kind of uh, harvest pressure can they withstand? Uh, I bring up the example here of, um, Lion's mane, which is actually rare uh, in New Hampshire, if it occurs in the state at all. Uh, but we have other species of herisium that occur. Again, they're mushrooms, so it may not really matter. But uh, every time you pick a mushroom, you take some of the substrate with it as well. And probably uh, some of its resources are removed from the body of the fungus that's otherwise left behind. Uh, harvesting from clean areas is a must. Um, roadsides, city parks, industrial areas, uh, not a good idea to harvest from um, these places and for obvious reasons, pollutants, contaminants, uh, the unmentionables. Um, being conservative is important, especially for foraging uh, plants, but I'll argue that it's important for mushrooms as well, exercising restraint uh, is difficult, but it's uh, an important and key trait of the ethical forager. So, uh, you know, really when you're thinking about uh, commercial harvest, uh, you really want to think about uh, long term, am I going to be able to come to this place again and again and again and harvest at the rate that I'm harvesting now? Or is this a one and done? And I'm sort of making the argument that if it's one and done, then you're really not thinking about uh, the sustainable approach to what you're practicing. Uh, keep it legal. Definitely check the regulations. Make sure that you have uh, landowner permission. Uh, if anything else, you definitely don't want to be in the wrong place uh, and someone unhappy about you on their land taking their uh, forest um, natural botanical products. So uh, definitely... Uh, know where you're allowed to collect and what permits are required to collect in these areas. Um, and lastly, as I mentioned, uh, the study uh, on mushrooms, and there's some other studies, uh, especially on the effects of uh, mountain biking with respect to mushroom production, suggests that uh, sticking to trails is really important for reducing your impact and localizing your impact so that um, you're not disturbing uh, in this sort of randomized area, um, but you're sort of minimizing your, uh, your effects sort of globally uh, by sticking to trails and, and really 
it's a great place to find mushrooms anyways, because uh, it's very difficult to find mushrooms in a dense understory anyway. So a nice open trail, especially with some sun shining is uh, a wonderful place to find mushrooms, uh, regardless of the fact that you're actually uh, doing um, severe, severe damage by going off trail. Uh, so before I kind of cut you all loose for uh, bombarding me with questions, uh, the last thing I just want to touch on are um, some ways that you can get involved uh, with documenting diversity and distribution. Um, I uh, use mushroomobserver.org, uh, which is a great website um, if you really want to get sort of more advanced with mushrooms. Uh, iNaturalist is great, especially if you're interested in things other than mushrooms. You can really document any form of life and interact with experts that will help you to identify that. Um, and I, iNaturalist is great as well because there's even an artificial intelligence app uh, sort of associated with it that will kind of give you a suggestion if the experts don't otherwise interact with your posts. Uh, but really all the top mushroom identifiers are on Mushroom Observer. Uh, and that's really the place to sort of more formally document um, with the potential of interacting with scientists that might request that you collect a specimen and send it to them and things like that. So um, it's a great place to find out what grows in your area, how frequently it's encountered, what time of year it's encountered, and where. Um, so other than that, uh, if you are an avid mushroom or plant collector and you are collecting bona fide data, weighing your hauls, things like that, uh, I'm interested in those data and sort of uh, collecting some baseline information on how much uh, special forest products are actually collected uh, across New Hampshire. So do get in contact with me uh, if you're interested in sort of providing your own, your own data or getting involved in a long-term study that is occurring on uh, both the White Mountain National Forest as well as on Three Mile Island uh, through um, the Appalachian Mountain Club. So we're involved in a couple of long-term research projects uh, specifically aimed at addressing questions regarding sustainable foraging practices, um, specifically mushrooms, but also for, I'm interested in plants as well. Uh, so with that, uh, there is some more to be found, uh, especially on Instagram and Facebook. You can follow me uh, at Mad Prof Mushies. Um, thanks very much, everyone, for your attention. Uh, and if there are any questions, uh, I'm happy to address them as best I'm able. I think I will stop sharing my screen. Well, thank you very much, All Tommy. Right. Uh, I put uh, his email in the chat so that if you want to contact him and let you know what data you're collecting, it's right there. We're a small enough group that if you would like to just you know, unmute yourself and ask a question, you're welcome to do so. And while I'm waiting for that, I will ask you a question, Tommy, from when we have been out hiking in the fall and we've run into those beautiful small red mushrooms that you had a picture of. You're saying those are okay to eat? The red bolete, I believe it was. Had a little small red, red bolete. Yeah. Ooh. Uh, well, I mean, they're there are a number of boletes, so that's uh, that's one of the questions. Is you know, um, are are you seeing what I'm seeing, or are you seeing what I'm showing? Uh, yeah, there uh, are uh, like some of my best foraging spots are on Plymouth State University, and the only one I'm nervous about saying that around is Jessica. Uh, but really, um, any place where you can. Uh, get under mature trees, especially conifers, but there you know, are mycorrhizal associates with many of the hardwood trees as well. Older trees, the longer they've been around, the more likely they are to form associations with more fungi. And so uh, if the conditions are right, then the mushrooms appear. And so um, college campuses are great for uh, diversity. And then when the conditions are right, abundance. Um, it just so happens that Plymouth is a college campus that is like herbicide, uh, pesticide free. 
And so um, it's a place that I feel comfortable forging because I know there's a long history of um, sort of uh, good groundskeeping practices there. Good point. Thank yeah. you. They always make me happy. They're very pretty. Eric and Judy ask, have you read Merlin Sheldrake's book? I have not. That's Entangled Life. Oh, someone recently told yeah. me about that. Entangled Life. Can you unmute yourself, Judy? Yeah, it's called Entangled Life, How Fungi Make Our World, Change Our Minds, and Shape Our Future. I'm on the cool. last chapter, and I, it's like dense and heavy, but it's super, super interesting. Um, he has a whole chapter on lichens, a whole chapter just on um, foraging, and cool. I'm reading a section on radical mycology where they're making leather out of fungi and mycelia yes. and the packaging and, packaging and yeah, yeah the oh company, there's some cool there's a stuff company in New York called ecovative yeah. which is their website is really cool i was on it the other day because i just got super interested from the book so um i'll type in the title of the book in the chat yeah uh, there's some amazing uh, technologies, and I, it's been uh, actually a couple of years since I taught my class. Uh, I'm always interested. I'm, I'm going to teach it again. I'm always interested in looking at uh, new textbooks, but um, some of these newer technologies uh, were kind of just being mentioned and featured when I was teaching uh, a few years back. So um, I'm not totally well versed in it, but I know there's some really fascinating developments in, you know, everything from packaging to, you know, like building structures, you know, chairs, sofas, et cetera. Um, there's uh, some pretty uh, neat applications. Oh, it's, uh, the book has been fascinating. I, yeah, I would agree. Uh, and also if you, are a listener and not a reader and uh, Entangled Life is very well read on an audio book. Mm. Yeah, it's a wonderful book. Other questions, comments? I had, I had a question. Um, Tom, you said that the data shows that picking the mushrooms don't seem to affect the future production. How about the spread of that species? In other words, if you remove the airborne spores, are you restricted? Yeah, yeah um, you know, there's there's some interesting thoughts about that. It's uh, difficult to study. Um, some research suggests that like 95% of the spores that fall from a mushroom fall within a matter of meters. Um, because the mushroom is just not that elevated. And so there is a very, very small percentage of spores that actually travel sort of infinity distance. Uh, but if you pick that mushroom up into the air and wave it around or put it in your basket and carry it a mile, uh, there's actually a much higher likelihood that a larger percentage of spores will travel infinity distance. Uh, so how you measure that? I don't know, um, but yeah, uh, it's, it's been debated. It's difficult to actually uh, quantify. Um, and the last thing that I'll just mention is in, um, in the study that I mentioned, there were, I think two or three uh, species of fungus that actually obligately reproduce by spores each year. And those even still um, were not affected by picking versus not picking treatments. So um, whereas most mushrooms kind of, the mycelium is there and it makes mushrooms each year from that same mycelium body, there are a few that are these sort of, kind of like with plants, these obligate cedars. Um, and those were not affected, which would suggest that uh, you're not removing spores from the system by picking a mushroom. Thank you. Yeah, it's a great question. Tommy, uh, you had uh, mentioned that um, uh, harvesting really would be just of the uh, um, ephemerals, the, the non-permanent. Um, are you referring to those just on the ground or are you also referring to those on trees? I'm thinking of the bear tooth. 
uh, I've seen on beach, mm -hmm. but I don't see him on a regular basis. So I'm wondering if that's an ephemeral or if that's a, a yeah that that is an ephemeral mushroom. It's a it's a soft bodied mushroom. So that's kind of the distinction is um, right. there are some mushrooms. Uh, nearly all of them occur actually i think all of them occur on wood um that might be like roots buried in the ground so it might not look like they're growing on wood um, but they're mushrooms that basically put on a new reproductive surface so they're sort of woody um, and some of the best examples are like the tinder conch and things like that um, as opposed to other mushrooms that that grow in the case of um, lion's mane or, or bear's head um, it will take maybe a couple like a week really to grow to full maturity or, or possibly even longer if it's cool. Um, and it will last for some time, but it's still measured in weeks rather than years, um, which uh, the perennial mushrooms are, uh, you know, I say woody, they're not, it's not wood because they're not plants, but um, they're sclerified. So you're talking more like the shelf fungi that would grow out from the... A lot of them have that shape. Yeah, okay. a lot of them are, are polypores. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So for us non-scientists, the shelf type, are you talking about the ones like on trees that kind of stick out like a shelf? Yep, exactly. And you're saying those are the ones that um, take longer? Yeah, basically each year they're growing larger, but the it's not growing a new mushroom. It's just adding a layer kind of mostly underneath Um and it's, it's just growing, it's adding to the existing mushroom. Cool. Thank and then you. the mycelium is in the wood digesting the tree. So you only see it on trees that are dying? Or dead, depending on the species. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So there's yes. a, a, a Ganoderma, um, which, you know, that if left to grow, they can get huge, but it takes decades. Thanks, Eric. I, I, Quinn and I have been out hiking and I thought, oh, what are these th shelves that, you know, are on the trees? Yeah. So thank you. I appreciate that. As, it's, as it's, opposed... It's, um, it's a great mushroom to go ahead and put your beer on when you need to have a uh, rest in the woods, you know. <laughs> yeah. As opposed to uh, a hen of the woods or Griffola, which can grow to be 100 pounds, but will still completely disintegrate, you know, a few weeks later. Other questions or comments? Just checking the chat. I've been. Okay. So, so Tommy, the one thing I do want to ask you is when can we arrange to go and um, uh, I can do some photography while you do some collecting because mm -hmm. I'm, <laughs> every fall I come across way too many that I have no idea what they are. Yeah, I mean, Senna and I are in the woods for two to three hours a day, pretty much every day in the summertime. Um, so uh, He's sending you pictures, but we won't knock on your door at dinner time. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> really good time for just kind of diversity and abundance is right before um, leaf, like leaf peeping. Um, really, when it's just starting to get cold at night because you'll still have lots of uh, sort of warm season summer species around, but you'll start to get the late season or cold loving species starting to creep in. Um, so you can really get a lot of species. Uh, that being said, uh, for those that are kind of wanting to learn, uh, like incrementally learning is probably a better strategy. And I often suggest people uh, perhaps just try to learn two or maybe three species per season. Uh, and that meaning like spring, early summer, late summer, fall. Uh, so perhaps you learn 10 species in a year uh, and that's 50 species in five years, but it's not 50 species in one year that you forget the name of all 50 of them and have to relearn uh, for five years straight and longer, you know? Yeah, because there's a lot, there are a lot of mushrooms and it can be overwhelming. 
Um, the other strategy that uh, works for some types of minds, uh, mine being one of them, is uh, to learn genera, to learn families, to learn the, the higher level, the higher order um, that this is all sort of uh, organized in. And you start to make the connections. So you'll start to recognize other species that, hey, that kind of looks like a boletus. And I know it because it looks like this other boletus that I, I know the species of. And you, you kind of recognize um, what links them together rather than the distinct features of each species, which can become overwhelming again. It's like learning one name instead of two. Mm -hmm. Well, I just want to say it was such a great season this year. What do you think for next year? You can predict it. Yeah, I have no idea. I mean, <laughs> uh, this year was weird. I uh, have never spent as much time under oak trees as I did this year. Um, it seems like I'm usually kind of, I mean, we're right at the base of the whites and I spent a lot of time in the mountains and really in boreal forest. And it was like an overwatered garden all summer where the boreal forest just never really, really produced. But the, the valleys and the oak woodlands and the mixed conifer forests, but like oak dominant lowlands, they were amazing, were amazing. Um, I produced volumes of, of some species that I have just never produced since being here, uh, which... You know, I've only been here since 2016, but um, it was amazing. Yeah. Porcini were spectacular. Um, I had my dehydrator running for about 17 days straight when Porcini were in season. And um, I have the dry weight. I have about uh, 10 and a half pounds of dried sliced Porcini and five and a half pounds of dried powdered. And so uh, it's about 15 pounds dried and that dries like eight or nine to one. So um, you can do the math, but it's uh, a, a couple hundred pounds of porcinis, uh, okay. oh, you know, over the course of maybe 10 days. Wasn't, wasn't that also true of the Matsutake mushrooms this year? They Matsutake were just... was also incredible, yeah. Um, this year I... I did not focus so much on um, really like what what you what some foragers will call like sort of preening a spot where you go back every day or every other day and you collect the mushrooms when they're in peak condition and you kind of let them grow. It's sort of like this fool's game where you're like letting this spot you know, just sit there in these beautiful mushrooms that might get eaten by a squirrel or there's another forager that knows about your spot or whatever. Um, with Matsis, which seem to just have a really amazing fruiting, um, I, three distinct flushes. Uh, I tried to identify new spots. So I think I identified 30, I'll say conservatively, new Matsutake spots this season. Um, just kind of, you know, cruising around when they were in mm -hmm. peak. So I didn't collect quite as much poundage, but I, I am hopeful that in future years, I'll be able to have something really spectacular with Matsutake as well. Yeah, which are worth their weight, you know, in, in gold. And that is my number one mushroom, by the way. Another question? Jessica, you're unmuted. Did you have a question? Oops. Nope, <laughs> I didn't mean to. <laughs> oh, that's okay. I think the cat bumped the button. Oh. <laughs> well, I want to thank you, Tommy. This has been fascinating. I now have so many more questions <laughs> that are really basic. Um, back in 2017, uh, Dr. Stoughton did mushroom walks for the museum, and it may be something that would be worth bringing back because that would be really, really cool. Uh, and I now have the time to be able to go and join you, which would be really great as well. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, like 
I'm not going to lie, those mushroom walks are part of how I've discovered some really sweet spots on Canvas. So um, I'm happy to lead more mushroom walks. That's um, great. And sure uh, the new director knows that would be just wonderful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all about, you know, timing with mushrooms. It's, you know, what it, it's one thing to know where they are. It's another thing to know when they're up. Um, and having home court advantage is helpful, but knowing when to be there is kind of the hard part, I think. So I don't mind showing people where the beautiful porcini are that they'll watch me walk away with. <laughs> well, thanks again. This has just been fascinating. Our next Mountain Voices talk will take place on January 13th. Professor Amy Villimagno will talk about pressure cooked, integrative impacts of chemical, thermal, and physical threats on native brook trout. So any of you who are fishers or know people who like to go fishing, I hope you will join us. And for me, I think it'll just be fast. I do not fish, but I'm really interested in knowing what is happening with the native trout because it says a lot about our, our environment. It is also the end of the year, and I want to point out that the museum runs on memberships and donations. All the exhibits, anything that happens within the museum is not covered by the university, but is something that the, the uh, museum deals with. So if you can make a donation, Rebecca's going to put the donation or the membership, excuse me, page in the chat, and it would be really helpful to the museum. The other thing I want to mention too is that I hope you have a very happy holidays and perhaps in the course of your holidays you may be interested in looking at some of the earlier mountain voices and so I'm going to put in the chat as well the earlier mountain voices so you know for that that downtime you have in the next couple of weeks, ha ha ha, after Christmas. Um, there are a lot of really fascinating presentations that have been given this fall that are preserved at the museum. If you forget this one, just type in Mountain Voices, Museum of the White Mountains, and it'll take you to the page and you can listen to some of the earlier presentations. Thank you, everyone. We appreciate seeing you here this month. Hope to see you January 13th at seven o'clock as well. Happy holidays.